So this Easter season, with Easter Sunday only really a few weeks ago, we've been looking at the topic living resurrection life. So just as a quick recap, and hopefully this will jog your memory if, um, if you were here or if you had a chance to listen back online. But the first week, we looked at how living resurrection life starts with encountering the risen Lord Jesus. There's no other way. There's no shortcut, but only through Jesus. He, as he says of himself, is the way, the truth, and the life. Resurrection life the life that we are called to live starts with and only comes through relationship with Jesus. It is a relational way of being. Living resurrection life is relational. And so secondly, the week after that, we, we looked at how living resurrection life means acknowledging that we're dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus. And you might remember that Roger got his staple gun out to pin our old selves to the cross that stays there. And we are, we, our sin-stained identity, our deeds worth death, the things that we've done that would leave us heading to eternal separation from God, nailed to the cross, taken down to the grave and left there, dead to sin, there's a wonderful picture of that, isn't there, in, in, in full immersion baptism, where the sinful nature is left in a watery grave, as the Apostle Paul talks about. And the resurrection life of Christ flows in and through us to the world around us. And then finally, last week, we looked at Romans 8 and the wonderful promise that living resurrection life is not something that we do in our own strength, but it's enabled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the Spirit that brought about our adoption into the family of God, the Spirit that helps us in our weakness and who intercedes for us and transforms us from within. The wonderful truth is that when we decide to follow Jesus, when those words that we declared together become truth in our lives, and we say, actually, they're not just words that I'm repeating because someone told me to stand up and say them, but I know them to be true. The truth of who Jesus was and is, when that becomes true for us and we accept that truth, when we give our lives to Christ, when we become Christians, when we let Jesus into our hearts, whatever, however we choose to describe it, there is a fundamental change in our identity. It's not just like joining a club or signing up for a gym or an email subscription. There is a fundamental change in who we are and what we do. I know that a few people here have, um, have recently retired. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Please don't take this in um, offensively if this is what you did. But at least in my mind, it seems ridiculous if after your retirement, there was no notable change in your lifestyle. If you still woke up at the same time and got dressed for work at the same time and got on the train and sat at your desk and opened your work emails, picked up the phone, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? And it would kind of be understandable maybe if you did that once or twice just out of habit because you've been working in the same place for 40 years and it's taken you a while to remember that you don't work there anymore. But actually, after a while, someone's going to have to have a really quite awkward conversation with you, aren't they? To say, actually, look, leave the old life behind. You don't work here anymore. Awkward. But at a much deeper level, when we choose to follow Jesus, when you say yes to making Jesus your Lord and your Savior, you begin a new identity. We begin a new identity. To stretch the analogy, the ridiculous retirement analogy, just a little bit further, you can turn to the issues, the challenges, the struggles of your past. And in Jesus' name, you can speak over those things. Say to them, you do not work here anymore. Those lies of the enemy that keep you trapped, that keep us held back, we can speak to them and say, you no longer work here. When we choose to follow Jesus, there is a fundamental change in our identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says this, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation 
has come. The old has gone and the new is here. The new creation is here. Hopefully, that takes you back in your minds to the words that we heard read by Charlie a few moments ago. John writes this just by way of reminder. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. If you are in Christ, the new creation is here. To be in, part, in Christ is to be people of the new creation. This is how the Apostle Paul describes us as citizens of heaven, eagerly awaiting a saviour from there. We belong to a different kingdom with different values, citizens of heaven. Our identity has changed. That same picture in Philippians chapter 3 verse 21, says in that same scripture, sorry, when we're talking about being, being citizens of heaven, Paul goes on to say that Christ, when he comes, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What's true of our inner being, what's true of our soul, will become, by God's grace, also true of our bodies. Hallelujah. At the return of Christ. And we eagerly re await that full reconciliation. We're living now in in-between times. We know that our identity has changed, but something is catching up. Right? And some of us feel that acutely through the pain that we're suffering, through the illness that we're suffering, through the prayers that are still going unanswered. But we know that we are part of the new creation. Living resurrection life like we've been thinking about is not just about a deeper quality and purpose to our earthly life. It's not about making life here on earth just a little bit better or maybe tolerable. Perhaps it's not about our earthly life at all. But a true step into the fullness of resurrection life that God has for each one of us. Remember, the Bible says that he longs that none should perish. To step into resurrection life fully, we need to gain and maintain an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective. If we're focused just on our earthly life and how following Jesus might make it a little bit better, we're missing out on the fullness of what God has for us in this resurrection life that he calls us to. John chapter 3 verse 16, I suspect the most well-known Bible verse in the world. It says, God loved the world so much, or God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have Eternal life, eternal, eternal life, right? You guys have heard that before? Yeah, good. Eternal life, great. So that's why Jesus died. I can't really get my head around this, but I wholeheartedly believe that there should be more change in us when we become a Christian, when we say yes to following Jesus, than when our earthly life comes to an end. Some people call that dying. Yeah, there should be more change in us when we decide to follow Jesus, then when our earthly life comes to an end. That might sound a bit bizarre, but you might remember that the, uh, the American evangelist who is now in glory, Billy Graham, he once famously said, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it, he said. I shall be more alive than I shall be more alive then than I am now which is now true, we thank the Lord, I will, I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. What an incredible perspective on the gift of eternal life. We're not going to die. Yes, our mortal bodies, our decaying bodies will probably come to an end unless Christ returns. And we pray that that would hasten, that that day would hasten. But that's not death. 
Yes, there's mourning for those who we, we won't see anymore, but for those who, who die in faith, we know that eternal life is, is where we take up residence. As Billy Graham says, we will just have changed address. So how can we live with that same incredible perspective that we might live in the fullness of this resurrection life that Jesus died to secure for us? Well, I want to very quickly just suggest three things. We could spend days, months, years discussing this, but just three, maybe four. We'll see how we do for time. But so living resurrection life requires a transformed relationship with money and wealth. If we're going to be people who have an eternal perspective, then we need to take seriously Jesus' words as we read in Matthew 6. He says this, Don't store up for yourself treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin don't destroy. It's good news. There are no rats in heaven. And where thieves, or if they are, they don't chew through your stuff. Anyway, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For many of us, it's really difficult to live our life with eternal perspective because we're so bought in to the temporary, to the earthly realm. We're so invested here and now with our mobile phones and our computers and our cars and our houses and all the trainers, all of these things that we have. As Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's really challenging, isn't it? Because we we like stuff. And also, we're brought up in a culture that tells us that more stuff is good. The accumulation of stuff is success and will make you happy. But Jesus is saying something else. Jesus is perhaps saying that the more that we accumulate and view as treasure, the harder it will be to live our lives with eternal perspective. Stuff isn't bad. Money in itself isn't bad. But when it becomes our hope, when it becomes our aspiration, when it becomes our comfort or our status, our security, then we very quickly start to lose sight of our citizenship in heaven, of our identity as people of eternity. I was listening to the radio this week and I just so happened to catch uh, a segment about the first emperor of China and the masses of things that he was buried with. You might remember most famously the the terracotta army of thousands, and they reckon that the vast percentages of them still haven't been archaeologically extracted, dug up. But not just that terracotta army um, for company in the afterlife or whatever he was hoping for, but so much wealth and possession. But that's not just true of, of that culture at that time. But throughout history and even now, so many cultures have this sense of being buried with the treasures that you've accumulated in in the way, in the hope that maybe they'll stand you in good stead for the life to come. And I was thinking about this and I was looking online at some of the pictures of this terracotta army and I was saying, well, what does it look like for us in the spiritual to be as proactive in accumulating spiritual treasure for heaven. Jesus says, yes, be proactive. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven so that when we enter that eternal kingdom and there's no more veil and no more separation, actually there's a wealth of stuff waiting for us. But how do we do that? Well, we do that by living a life of faith, by choosing to put Jesus first and therefore putting others first, by showing kindness by showing grace, by seeking what God is doing and by joining in. One of the ways that we store up treasure in heaven, remarkably, is by not seeking praise on earth. Doesn't Jesus say that actually those who've received their thanks and their praise in this life won't get it in the next? So let's be mindful as we serve, as we serve one another. Let's be mindful that we're not doing it for that pat on the back, for that recognition, for that email to say, you know, I really like the way that you 
I'm trying not to pick on anything in specific today. The way that you welcomed on the door today was just brilliant. It's great to encourage each other, but let's not lap that up in a way that means that we miss out on the treasure store that God would have us enjoy for eternity, where the rats aren't going to eat it. So first of all, living life, um, resurrection life, this eternal perspective on resurrection life requires a transformed relationship with money and wealth. Secondly, it enables a transformed relationship with pain and suffering. As Charlie read from us earlier from Revelation 21, verse 4 says this, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I don't know what struggles you're going through at the moment. I don't know what pain physically or emotionally you're experiencing at the moment. But the truth is that if you love Jesus, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that situation, that pained situation, that trial is only temporary. It will end. And this too shall pass. It will end. And the challenge is when you put these two things together, when we're so invested in the here and now through our material wealth, but we're also experiencing so much suffering, it's hard to ever picture an end to that, isn't it? And because we can't picture an end to it, we then start to let it define us. Actually, it's my ill health that defines me. It's my childhood trauma that defines me. It's my broken family that defines me. It's my lost job that defines me. It's the difficulty that I've had in all sorts of churches that defines me. It's not. What defines us is what Jesus has done on the cross, which has opened a way that we can be citizens of heaven and spend forever with God. And so I want to encourage us to view our pain, to view our suffering as temporary, as temporary. And for some of us, that's really difficult because we've started to let us define, started to let it define us. And for some of us, even this morning, God is saying, no, find a new identity. Find an identity that isn't shaped in the negative, but that is shaped in the positive of who God is and how he sees you. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. Funnily enough, the Apostle Paul puts this far better than I ever could. He says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Come on. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what, we, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is what? Is eternal. We need to shift our eyes from the seen temporary to the unseen eternal because that's the kingdom that we are called to belong to. Living resurrection life, this is the third point, um, is fueled by a radical pursuit of the presence of God, a radical pursuit of the presence of God. Again, John describes this wonderful revelation, this wonderful vision, and he says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. We pray, don't we, in the Lord's Prayer, and we'll use these words later, your kingdom come and your will be done. The place of God's kingdom is the place of God's presence as well as being the place of his perfect rule and reign. And how do we become people who allow the presence of God to invade the here and now? By radically pursuing his presence. It might be good news to some of us, but that doesn't mean turning up for more church meetings. It might do, but it doesn't necessarily mean turning up for more church meetings. But it means developing the discipline of finding the presence of God for many of us in our everyday lives. Often in the mundane, there's such beauty in some of the monastic practices where we realize that actually as we walk this journey or as we dig this flower bed or as we wash these dishes or as we change these nappies or whatever the mundane in your life looks like or might look like soon... The presence of God is there waiting for you. There's so many things that we could talk about how we become more aware of the presence of God, but I just want to encourage us that it seems like one of the most basic ones is to be thankful. As you know, Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise. 
It's through our thankful, our hearts, through our posture of gratitude that we start to realize, hang on a minute, that place that I sought was, was a barren land. That place that I despised or that I turned my back on, actually God is there and he loves it and he sees it as beautiful. Living resurrection life is fueled by a radical pursuit of the presence of God. And where we find those moments and those times and places of being acutely aware of the presence of God, it reminds us that we belong to a different kingdom. It reminds us, we get a foretaste, don't we? And we think, wow, yes, I was made for something more than just this. I was made for something more than just what I see. And for some of us, we need to develop some practices that help us recognize this presence of God. It might be prayer and being more disciplined in our prayer life. It might be reading the Bible and being more disciplined, more committed to. Some people don't like the word discipline. I think it can be a positive thing. But more committed to reading the Bible at regular times with the pursuit of God's presence. You know, not just trying to understand it intellectually, but saying, God, where are you in these words? And what does that mean for my life? And Jesus also encourages us to find him in the lowly, in the last, the least and the lost, that's wh that which you've done for the least of these. He tells his listeners, you did for me. So let's find the presence of God on the margins of society amongst the broken and the hurting and the lost. That's what he calls us to. And finally to end, living resurrection life takes seriously and urgently the destiny of those who don't yet know Jesus. You might have noticed, you know, kind of the, our reading was going so well, wasn't it? It sounded so hopeful. And then we got to verse 8, and it says this, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and the liars, they'll be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You know, and I was so tempted to say to, to say to Charlie, you know, don't worry about that verse. Let's just focus on the good stuff. Let's focus on our eternal hope in heaven. But the truth is that they go hand in hand. If we're believing for the reconciliation of all things, for the new kingdom, for the new heaven and the new earth, we also have to take seriously and urgently that our time of grace, our period of grace in which we live in, is limited. We have to become urgent about sharing the message of the gospel in word and deed so that others might say yes to this invitation to eternity, to this invitation to eternal abundant life through the death and resurrection of Jesus. I pray that even now, perhaps in our hearts, there'd be a stirring to say, what can I do to extend that invitation? How can I live out God's heart that none should perish? And those two things go together, don't they? Word and deed. Our deeds, the way that we live, authenticates, rubber stamps the things that we say to be true about God. And equally, the way that we live provokes questions that a watching world might say, well, how come it is when everyone else is full of stress and anxiety, when everyone else is stabbing each other in the back. How come it is that you choose to live differently? How come it is that you seem to have a different hope? How come it is that when everyone else was pushing for that promotion at work and seemed to be backbiting and trying to get in the manager's pocket, you didn't seem to be that bothered? How come when we face trials and tribulations, you seem to act as if you knew they would pass? Well, why? Because we know they will pass. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, says this of God. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Isn't that great? He's made everything beautiful in its time. But it goes on to say, he has also set eternity in the human heart. God has set eternity in the human heart. I believe that there is something deeply dehumanizing about the, the project to distract us from our eternal identity. To forget that we are people of eternity is to forget that we are human. Because the Bible says that God has set eternity in the hearts of humanity. 
If we, as the people of God, can grasp this, can start living by different values for a different kingdom, we will start to experience the joy, the power, the freedom of full resurrection life. I'm going to worship together in a moment, but can I invite us to stand if we're able, and I'll pray for us. Maybe just an encouragement in your, in your heart, in your spirit, or even out loud, you might just want to start speaking to God, acknowledging those things that He's been saying to you this morning. Lord God, we thank you that your word says that of the, the increase of your rule and reign, there will be no end. That your kingdom is perpetually on the increase in this world. We thank you that we have a sure and certain hope. So help us to lift our eyes from the, the here and the now, from the temporary scene to the eternal unseen. Even now, Holy Spirit, would you come and move among us? Help us to let us let go of those things that we've gripped so tightly. Come and set us free to be people of eternity.